Welcome to Spirits of Whiskey. We explore the wide world of whiskey through the many colorful personalities who make it, promote it, write about it, and more. With each podcast, Carrie Moynihan, a certified bourbon steward and bartender, and yours truly, Philip Dobar, director of the Cocktail Collection, interview whiskey's most important names. From high-profile makers, blenders, and ambassadors. To out-of-the-way innovators and remote pioneers. Join us as we discover the people and elements that give the water of life its spirit. It is Whiskey Wednesday, December 9th, 2020, and you're listening to episode 26. Today, we speak with the creators of the new Scotch whiskey documentary, The Water of Life. But first, stay tuned for this week's Whiskey Chronicles. Have you heard about Anchor? It's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you. So it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Scotch whiskey has a long history of appearing in films and on television, and the on-screen use of scotch, or other whiskeys, is almost always a matter of directorial intent. In dramas, there's never a drop poured on the silver screen unless something big is about to happen. For example, in Martin Scorsese's 1990 film Goodfellas, Joe Pesci's Tommy orders a scotch and water during a poker game with other Mafia family members. The bartender doesn't hear him, and for his quote-unquote transgressions, Tommy shoots a few rounds into the bartender's foot. Another great example is Stanley Kubrick's 1980 film The Shining. Jack Torrance, played by Jack Nicholson, who's already begun his descent into madness, orders a bottle of bourbon from the hotel bartender just prior to his wife's running in to report that there's someone else in the hotel. Jack's character becomes even more unhinged, and the terror mounts accordingly. In the 2012 James Bond movie Skyfall, starring Daniel Craig, Agent 007's iconic shaken, not stirred martini is replaced by various expressions of McAllen. In the courtyard scene, Javier Bardem's Silva offers a 50-year-old dram of McAllen as he places his own shot glass on the head of his female captain. Shortly following, an action sequence featuring gunplay aplenty breaks out. Whiskey plays a role in many comedies as well. In the first American Pie movie, released in 1999, Stifler's mom is drinking whiskey when Finch finds her alone in the pool room. She offers him an 18-year-old scotch, and the seduction is on. And who can forget, I love scotch, I love scotch, scotchy scotch scotch. Here it goes down, down into my belly, mmm, mmm, mmm. Uttered by Will Ferrell in 2004's Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy. But let's not neglect the numerous times we encounter scotch whiskey on the small screen. The characters on AMC's hit show Mad Men seem to constantly have a scotch in one hand and a cigarette in the other. On NBC's Parks and Recreation, Lagavulin 16 is the go-to dram of Nick Offerman's Ron Swanson and the fictitious scotch called Glen Callan appears in Community on the same network. According to a 2018 article in Whiskey Advocate, the following are the 10 greatest movies for whiskey lovers. The Angel's Share 2012, a Scottish film about a scheme to steal a rare barrel of whiskey. The Bank Dick 1940, henpecked Egbert Suzet embarks on comic adventures as a substitute film director and unlikely bank guard. Kingsman, The Secret Service, 2014. A spy organization recruits a promising street kid into the agency's training program, while a global threat emerges from a twisted tech genius. Laura, 1944. This classic film noir mystery, directed by Otto Preminger, features a bottle of scotch as a pivotal clue. Lost in Translation, 2003. This multi-Oscar-nominated film by writer-director Sofia Coppola stars Bill Murray as a world-weary actor filming a Suntory commercial in Tokyo. Skyfall 2012. James Bond's loyalty to M is tested when her past comes back to haunt her. When MI6 comes under attack, 007 must track down and destroy the threat, no matter how personal the cost. Thunder Road 1958. A veteran returns home from the Korean War and takes over the family moonshining business. He has to battle both big city gangsters intent on taking over and officers of the law intent on putting him away. True Grit, 1969 and its 2010 remake. A stubborn teenager enlists the help of a tough U.S. Marshal to track down her father's murderer. 28 Days Later, 2002. Four weeks after a mysterious incurable virus spreads across the U.K., a handful of survivors attempt to find sanctuary. 
and Whiskey Galore, 1949 and its 2016 remake. Based on a real incident that took place off the coast of Eriske in 1941, the film depicts Scottish Islanders' efforts to plunder 50,000 cases of whiskey from a stranded ship. There are dozens more movies and television shows that employ scotch and various other whiskeys for narrative effect. For links to some of them, please visit our website for today's show notes. In addition to all these other narrative films and television series, there have been quite a few documentaries that take whiskey as their subject. Coming up, we'll talk to the makers of one such documentary, The Water of Life. Stay with us. Hey, do you like whiskey, food, and adventure? I do. Hi, I'm Carrie. I'm Philip. I'm Louise. I'm the chef. Chef Louise Leonard, as in our World of Wheezy segment host here on the podcast, and Whiskey, A Chef's Journey. That chef. That's right, the project that started this very podcast. The series stars our very own chef, Louise Leonard, winner of Emmy-winning The Taste on ABC. And explores and connects the worlds of whiskey and food, city by city, country by country. Would you like to see this spirited culinary adventure on a TV near you? Well, you can by helping us finish the pilot episode through our crowdfunding campaign. For more information, including behind-the-scenes photos, videos, and incentives, and to make a pledge, visit our website, whiskeyachefsjourney.com. Or search for our campaign, Whiskey A Chef's Journey, at gofundme.com. That's gofundme.com now. Well, I think it's a cheers to that. (laughs) Let's. Cheers. Cheers. Today on Spirits of Whiskey, we have three special guests, three people whose passion for whiskey runs so hot that they risked their lives and livelihoods and life savings, should they have any, making a film about whiskey. Today we have with us Brittany Curran, executive producer, Trevor Jones, producer, and Greg Swartz, director of, this is a wonderfully long and highly descriptive title, The Water of Life, a whiskey film, the craftsmen, chemists, and renegades who saved scotch whiskey and ignited a single malt revolution. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Thanks for being here. I'm so glad all of you guys could make it. Good to have you. So as we usually do, we start off talking about your whiskey journey. So first, I'm going to ask each of you personally about your personal whiskey journey, and then how the whiskey journey of the movie kind of started and how it came about. So Brittany, we'll start with you. What is your whiskey journey? And have you been a whiskey lover for long? Or is this a relatively new thing? I guess relatively new. I It's funny, I actually didn't even drink any alcohol, not a sip of alcohol until I was almost 23 years old. Wow. Yeah. And now I'm making a movie about whiskey. So that's how those things happen. <laughs> um, but I remember I fell in love with whiskey actually on St. Patrick's Day. I know we're making a movie about Scotch whiskey, so this is maybe a little sacrilegious to talk about Irish whiskey, but it is my journey. That's okay. The Irish made it before the Scots did, so <laughs> okay. you got to start somewhere. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm uh, you know, third-generation Irish, so I like to celebrate St. Patrick's Day with its food and drink. And so a few years ago, my fiancé bought six bottles of Irish whiskey ranging in price and flavor profile. And we had two friends over and we did our own little mini tasting. And I remember that's when I fell in love with it was that night on St. Patrick's Day. And the last whiskey that I tried was Connemara whiskey. And we bought that because my great grandparents are from Connemara. And Connemara is really peated. And good thing my grandparents are from Connemara. And he randomly bought that for that reason, because I discovered that I love pita whiskey. And then I found out that scotch whiskey is generally, it can be peated a lot, especially from Isla. And then I discovered that I really, really love scotch. And then Greg Swartz, my old pal, enters the picture with the film. Brittany, where'd you grow up? Did you grow up in a drinking culture? No, I grew well, I mean, I guess in essence I did. I grew up in Massachusetts. So I, I grew up in an Irish Catholic Massachusetts family. Uh-huh. So I guess you could call that a drinking culture. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. A bit. <laughs> <laughs> But no, actually, in my household, my parents don't, my dad doesn't drink at all. And my mom drinks a champagne every like blue moon. Okay. So no, I didn't grow up around it at all. All right. And uh, I just kind of came to it myself. Um, yeah, it was kind of random. Like Christmas and Easter Catholics, they're New Year's Eve drinkers. Oh, yeah. I think a lot of my relatives might be, but my particular, I missed out on that one. <laughs> 
Although now that I drink a bit, my mother drinks more now too. And so her and I, we enjoy way more wine together than we ever did before the whiskey documentary. So even though it's not whiskey, I've inspired my mother to drink more. (laughs) Good job. (laughs) Making my mom worse. (laughs) That's generally how it works. We drive our parents to drink. So, Oh, and I definitely have. (laughs) <laughs> All right. And so then since Greg came into your picture, we'll start with, we'll go to Greg next. So Greg, tell us about your whiskey journey. And if you were the one who came up with this movie, we would love to hear about how that came to be as well. Well, those two stories kind of line up pretty nicely because what happened was a long time ago, I was an exchange student in Scotland Nice. when I was in college. And I'd be lying if I said whiskey was front and center on that journey because I was 19. And so I went from living in Pennsylvania where I wasn't allowed to drink to being <laughs> having unfettered access to beer and drinks. And, and right. so, you know, I, I drank fairly robustly that year. And then you had to come home and wait again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I remember <laughs> buying a bottle of Glenlivet in the duty free on the way home thinking that as soon as I landed, I was going to be tackled and have it taken away from me. But no one ever did. And just by pure dumb luck, someone I knew in Scotland, not very well, actually, one night asked my friend and I if we wanted to go to the Bon Accord, which I'd never heard of. And at the time, wasn't really kind of the revered place it is now, but it, even back then had every whiskey in Scotland. Mm-hmm. That's where you did all of the uh, interview with Ralphie Mitchell, I think, yes? Yes, yes, we did. We would have done more interviews there if we'd had more time there, but they would only allow us to shoot there when they weren't ah. open. <laughs> so, so we had to go in the mornings. But Ralphie's tight with them, so he, you know, they let us shoot there. And I mean, actually, Paul, the owner, has been wonderful to us. We've had a bunch of evenings there since. And then, you know, a few years ago, my wife had never been to Scotland. And so for our 10th anniversary, we went to Scotland. And on the advice of some of my friends from back when I lived there, we did the whiskey walk in Speyside and Dufton which I highly recommend to anyone. And it was during that walk where you basically, Dufton's so concentrated with nine distilleries, I think seven open, two closed distilleries in the town. And it's a tiny little town. You walk from one to the other and you sort of learn as you're walking. So it's kind of a fun hike and, and you know, it involves a lot of whiskey. Then you get driven home at the end because you've had like seven or eight whiskeys by the end of it. But during that time, it started percolating in my mind. Actually, I remember very specifically, we were walking by Glen Fittich and Glenfiddich was having new stills put in. So they had removed the entire wall of their still house. And so you could see right in, even though it was nighttime. And Glenfiddich is so huge. And there's just so many stills there. And I started just kind of, that piqued my curiosity. And I started debating, or not debating, but ruminating on the size and scale of that versus little tiny craft distilleries. And, you know, I'd, I'd known the whiskeys, but I'd never been to Isla at that point. And I'd been to Scotland seven times, but never been to Isla. So as I kind of creatively explored it, I'm a partner in a production company with Trevor and also I'm Trevor's next door neighbor. So when I got back, I, we started talking about it while we were drinking the copious amounts of whiskey I brought back with me. And that the idea was sort of born of that. How long ago was that, that trip? 17, 2017. Okay. Okay. So this is a pretty tight turnaround. Yeah. It took about a year for the idea to gel. Mm-hmm. Then we, you know, we shot in late 18 and into 19. Okay. Wow. Very cool. And then Trevor, let's talk about your whiskey journey. Were you into whiskey at all before Greg came home with all this copious bottles of whiskey? I was. I was into whiskey. Booze was very, very common in my house. I grew up in a very strong drinking culture. My dad was a professional. (laughs) Even when I was a child, he'd come home and he'd bring some kind of liqueur that he had bought or that someone had given him or someone had made or that he had made and wanted me to have a little sip and you know, could I taste the orange in it or the lemon? My dad used to make wine in the basement. And I'll never forget the smell of homemade wine fermenting in the basement. Not pleasant generally for a kid <laughs> anyway. But eventually I moved away from home. I grew up in Toronto. I, I moved away from home to New York. And my whiskey journey starts really in New York where I had had lots of liqueurs. My dad was very into that kind of thing and very into experimenting with homemade stuff. I got to New York and uh, my mother, who was Irish, had a cousin flying in. He was a pilot for Aer Lingus. He was flying into New York and he wanted to meet me since I was in New York. He was much older than me. And as a 19-year-old kid, a pilot was pretty much the coolest thing I could think of. Right. Sure. So when he wanted to go out and meet me for a drink, I said, of course. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, but you're 19 and it's 21 here. Yeah, right. I was a big guy and I'd never really had much of an issue getting into a bar in New York. So I met him for a drink and he ordered a whiskey, neat, which I had never had before, but wanting to be as cool as my pilot cousin, <laughs> I ordered the same thing. And so to be honest, I did not care for it. So we had three or four of those. And it was a long time since after that, that I had another whiskey, but that was my first 
whiskey was that with my cousin. It's something I always remember of trying to be as cool as I could to be cool like my pilot cousin underage drinking with him in a New York bar. It's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Hadn't occurred to me how much we were drinking. He as a pilot as well. Uh, <laughs> that was. Well, he wasn't flying, flying right well, after. Hopefully, I hope. hopefully, he, uh, yeah, hopefully, he did not have a tight turnaround. <laughs> no, I, you know the one other funny thing about that experience was the first time I ever heard the term jumper. Uh-huh. Uh, he told me because I'd never met him before oh, about the jumper seat. I'd never met him before, so when he told me I'll be there, I'm going to be one wearing a white jumper. Uh-huh. I remember thinking to myself. What on earth is that? Like, is that like a pilot onesie that he's going to be wearing? Like, a, feels weird that he would wear that to the bar, but um, sweater, as it turns out. Now. You're like, okay, I guess I got to go find a jumper to bring. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, oh, is that, the, is that the outfit? That's the cool outfit? I should probably wear that. So in the end, you recognized him and you were able to- Yeah, I saw the, the sweater. He was one of those Irish sweaters that are so identifiably Irish. As soon as he yeah. walked in, I was like, oh, that's the guy. Got it. Got it. Uh, Greg, I'm assuming you brought the idea to Trevor. And then how did you guys decide to bring Brittany into this? Well, Brittany and I have been friends for a long time. We've worked together. We actually worked together. She was in a short film I made years ago. And we got along very well and always looked for opportunities to work together again. And she approached me and said, you know, she was really excited about what we were doing and she'd like to get involved. And cool. you know, we were more than happy to do that. So, yeah, I mean, it was Brittany's idea, really. Awesome. Oh, my God. I totally don't remember it that way, but I believe you. I'm really- <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, what's funny is you, if, unless I'm wrong, the way it was first brought up to me wasn't by you, but it was by James. Oh, really? Yeah. He said Brittany's interested in getting involved in this. That's Brittany's fiance. Oh, that's so cute. Look at that. Yeah. Looking out for me. <laughs> yeah, so he brokered this beautiful relationship. I know. I didn't even know that. Thanks, James. Give you 10%. Greg, yeah, I did a movie with Greg when I was 14. Oh, wow. And so I, I've literally known Greg for like half of my life now. Wow. And yeah, it was right around the time that I was getting into whiskey and getting into producing. And I've been literally wanting to work with Greg, like again, since I was 14 years old. And so it kind of all checked all the boxes. Great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Brittany, you've been acting since a young age, Yeah, reading your bio, and you've been on some pretty popular shows along the way. I know my daughter was of a certain age when The Sweet Life of Zach and Cody was big. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I used to work on that. I used to do oh. uh, the audience for that show. So I wonder if I was ever there when you were there. Oh, my Maybe. God. What a small world. That's yeah. so cool. I wonder if I met you back then. Ah, oh, it's very possible. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, I've been mean, acting since I was 11 years old. Yeah, and yeah, I love doing the Disney stuff. I'm such a Disney nerd still. And then Men of a Certain Age, which is one of the its untimely demise, was one of the great crimes of television history. I agree. I know mm-hmm. I'm a little biased, but I really do think that that show really was canceled before its time. Yeah. Yeah, I loved that show. And Brittany and I used to share an office on the Paramount lot for a long time. And I loved that show. And, it, and I, that wasn't just because I knew someone in it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, when I was doing the show, and then we got the office during that time, because the show shot at Paramount as well. Yeah. Oh, I miss that. Yeah. Miss Ray Romano. Ah, that's another one I worked on. I worked on Ray Romano's Everybody Loves Raymond, too. Oh, really? Yeah, that was fun. And more small world evidence, Tom Caltabiano, who works with the Center for Culinary Culture, which is home to the Cocktail Collection, and does virtually all of our event photography. He was a writer on Everybody Loves Raymond for its entire run. Oh, yep. And he would always come up into the audience and take pictures of the audience and of the set and of the people. So when I ran into him at one of Philip's events, I'm like, hey, I know you. You used to work on Everybody Loves Raymond. (laughs) Oh, that's so cool. I love that. Yeah, we had some of the same people from Everybody Loves Raymond on our shoot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Yeah, Very cool. So anyway. All right, let's get back to the movie. Yeah, back to the movie. So We want to know about the film's conceptual development. How did you take the idea for a film about whiskey and sort of develop the film around it? How did the film bloom from it? I think that it changed a bit, to be honest. It started as a bit more, I don't know that it was ever going to be a travelogue, but it was a little bit more of a travelogue. It was going to be a, you know, let's go to 17 distilleries and do a little bit about each one. And then more and more, we sort of got immersed in the stories aspect of it. And more and more, some of those stories kind of took front and center Mm -hmm. and other ones did not. Mm -hmm. So it certainly shifted in our focus 
as it developed, one of the things that we compared it to was Jiro Dreams of Sushi mm, mm-hmm. and, you know, wanted to be immersive in the process and not just focus on this week we're at Spring Bank and they're going to let us shovel some peat. And, you know, this week we're here and we're going to do this. And that's not, there are films like that and they're yeah, actually quite good. Absolutely. There's, it's just not what we wanted to uh-huh. do because part of that would have required me being a host on it and I didn't want to be a host on it. Uh-huh. Right. I think one of the big challenges for food film and it's just as true for drinks, is that the audience can't taste the food mm-hmm, or the drink. Mm-hmm. Right. So we wanted to create an experience that sort of felt and looked and sounded like Scotland. It, it, much to Trevor and our cinematographer's consternation at first, I was adamant that we shoot in November because I didn't want Scotland to look like it does in June. I wanted it to look like Scotland. And Scotland is most Scottish-ishness in, in, you know, in October, November, December. And yeah. Oh, sure. You wanted it to jibe with the romantic notion of Scotland that non-Scots have. Yeah. And, but we didn't want to do bagpipes and kilts and that stuff. Shortbread tin is our one Scottish producer calls it. <laughs> we didn't want to do that stuff. We wanted to look like it tastes. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, that's the best way I think to say it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you decided that the better way to tell the story was to take a deeper dive with a few people and a few brands rather than doing a multi-region travelogue. Yeah. It was so expansive that we, we kind of had to really narrow it down pretty quickly. And the better stories kind of presented themselves to us as much as anything. Okay. So it was a process of discovery, really. Well, yeah. Like when we were shaping the story, I went to an event at Seven Grand here in LA. Mm-hmm. It was, I oh, think, yeah. their 10th anniversary party. Mm-hmm. And I met a guy named David Laird, who was the US ambassador for Balvenie. Mm-hmm. And I just was chatting with him. And I was telling him, by this point, we had already sort of kind of locked in one of our stories was going to be the Brooklady story. And then while we were talking, he said, you know, all of that creative stuff Brooklady did, they couldn't have done if David Stewart hadn't done it first. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And it was a real conversation. He wasn't, I know when I say it like that, so concise, it sounds like he was just shilling for his brand, but he wasn't. It was an actual conversation. And he was saying that, you know, David Stewart will not brag. David Stewart will not boast, you know, but he really was the first person to do a lot of this stuff and to do it very quietly. So then when we started kind of, you know, and I've always really liked Bob Antia. It's one of my first whiskeys that I like. And so when we started sniffing around the story more, we found that not only was that true, but that David Stewart had recently named his heir apparent. Mm-hmm. Kelsey McKinchy. Yep. Mm-hmm. And she was very, very young. And so, you know, we reached out to them. David Laird helped us connect with them and we got that set up. So the stuff like that just kind of came up organically. That's awesome. So how did you decide that Jim's story would be like the main showcase? Well, I mean, you know, it ticks all the boxes, really. They were broke. They never should have made it. They almost didn't make it. They were aggressively disruptive. They were proudly embracing tradition and being incredibly experimental at the same time, which I think is really exciting. And then it's funny because the story of Jim McEwen has been told a bunch of times. You know, it's been 60 Minutes. There's another film that's partially about Jim. Right. But the thing that we realized no one ever dealt with was the Mark Rainier side of that story. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, talking to Mark, I always think that Mark and Jim are like together. It's like one of those bands that make great music and you just knew they weren't going to last more than two or three albums. <laughs> 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 and then when we met Mark, he was just as charismatic as Jim in a very different way. Mm-hmm. Right. I referred to both of them several times as John and Paul, the John and Paul yeah. of the whiskey world. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. I think in the film, Charlie McLean says these old whiskey boys, so they find it hard to give up. They, they don't know what to do with themselves mm-hmm. once they. Mm-hmm. Right. That's a good one. How did you get Charlie McLean? Because he's everywhere. He's everything. He's like the authority, I think, on Scotch a lot of times. Yeah. So I was excited to see him talk about all that stuff. First of all, Charlie's fantastic. I mean, he's just wonderful. I mean, he was wonderful to us, not just in information, just friendly. And I mean, we interviewed him multiple times. And the second time he went to his house, he said, oh, just let's just do it at my house. Come over in the morning and I'll make you all breakfast before we do it. <laughs> so what did he make? Did he make some Scottish food or just like eggs and stuff? He made us bacon rolls. Oh, yeah. what does that mean? What's in a bacon roll? That is literally what it sounds like. <laughs> just it is, bacon. It is <laughs> bacon on a roll. Wow. It's a very popular Scottish breakfast thing because, you know, their bacon's like Irish bacon. It's more ham-like. It's like Canadian right. bacon kind mm-hmm. of, you know, mm-hmm. and it's a bit more meaty. But, you know, we spent the whole day at his house. And then when we interviewed Blair Bowman, we interviewed him in Charlie's house. Oh, wow. Charlie was like, oh, don't bother moving around. Just have him come here. Very cool. So the way we got to Charlie was actually one of our producers She lives in Scotland, and she and her husband, they shoot photography using Victorian-era cameras. Oh, wow. 
and Charlie had posed for them. You know, they had his contact information because they used this 170 year old camera to shoot photos. And Charlie had been in one of their photos for something they did. That's really cool. Because if you're going to shoot somebody with a 170 year old camera, Charlie's the guy you want to shoot with. It. <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally. And I hope that he was holding a dram in the picture and but... wearing his monocle, frankly. Oh, exactly. Yeah, it's his monocle. And how did you get Dr. Rachel Berry? We reached out to Brown Foreman and I'll tell you this. The one thing that we didn't get that I wish we would have gotten is we got no verite of her. We got no footage of her at work. Yeah. She was available to us for, I think it was four hours and you know, she couldn't have been nicer. There was a hotel bar in Edinburgh. They brought her there, told us to be there. We were lit. She walked in, we chatted for a while and she was gone, but we never got to see her at work. Yeah. We got to see Kelsey McKechnie and David Stewart. We got to see them at work. Right. Billy Walker, we got to see him at work. We got to see Jim at work. With Dr. Barry, we just had to rely on archival photos because she just was too busy. And she was just in the process still of really getting established at Brown Foreman. You know, she had just moved over to there. Very what cool. hotel so. bar were you at? <laughs> I don't remember, to be honest with you. <laughs> I remember it was west of the city and it okay. wasn't a big, it was just a small little kind of old Scottish hotel, maybe at 20 room hotel. After we finished filming in Edinburgh, I stayed for an extra two days and literally just went on like my own Harry Potter tour of like, yeah. JK Rowling wrote the book. And <laughs> I maybe went up to the, the Edinburgh castle at three in the morning and drank some whiskey up there alone. <laughs> nice. Inspiration for Hogwarts. I know that's probably illegal, but it was a long time ago <laughs> and I'm not in that country anymore. Mm. So. Right. <laughs> they can't come after you now. It was one of those places that were so amazing in, in Scotland where it's like a it was like a hotel that, that was probably like an Earl's house or something at one point. Oh wow. That's cool. <laughs> Kelsey, how did she become his apprentice? Like, I mean, did she just say after she finished all of her schooling, just kind of go over there and say, Hey, I want to be your apprentice? Or was like, did they find her because she was such a great student? How did that come about? She was already working for Belvenny or for Grant and Sons. I think, I believe it was like a quality control panel. You know, she has the credentials. You know, she right. has, she was, she's a graduate of the Harriet Watt distilling program mm -hmm. and now has a master's, but she was getting her master's while she worked there. And I believe they were working on tasting panels. She was on quality control and they put out an email, she said, looking for volunteers for a tasting panel of a new whiskey. And she volunteered and then she went to them afterwards and said, I, you know, I think I'm actually quite good at this. And they agreed. And so they kept her, they made her an apprentice something or other, apprentice blender. And, you know, David Stewart used to be the master blender for Glenfiddich and Balvenie. And then mm -hmm. he, I think 11 years ago, gave up Glenfiddich and just chose to focus on the smaller distillery as he's gotten older. And so now he still does Balvenie. And his title now is, I think, Malt Master, which yes. I think is more of an honorary title. than I don't think he's working there nine to five. I, I, he actually told us that he has a certain number. I think he works 100 days a year or something like that for that. Oh, wow. But he's a big part of what he does now is training her. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was quite the turn of fate that she goes, yeah, I'll volunteer for a tasting panel. Sure. What have I got to lose? Yeah. Um, absolutely nothing. <laughs> Everything to gain. Honestly, after hearing that story, I thought I should call around and ask if anyone was looking for volunteers. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Just, I think, yeah, just let's start do that. Interning. Let's all do that. Let's, let's all intern. call up and say, hey. Yeah. So one of the distilleries that I spent a bit of time at was actually Brick Lottie. So I was kind of intrigued by your story. And every time you're going through the distillery and stuff, I'm like, oh, I was there. I was there. I was there. I know that place. That's great. And then I don't know if you guys saw the picture that I sent back. I can't tell because, you know, it's been a few years, but I swear to God that my tour guide is in your end credits. Oh, really? <laughs> Free beard. And I can't remember his name, but the hotel we were staying, it was this little inn and they had this corner bar. And I remember going to the bar the first night we got there. I came down to the bar after, you know, dinner and stuff. And there was our tour guide. And I was like, oh, hey, dude. So he's like, yeah, there's not much to do here. So we just go to all the little pubs. And I'm like, okay, right on. So Would have had to have been David, I would guess, right? I think that could have been his name. I, I mean, it was five years ago. I don't really remember. There was a lot of drinking. David Hope, yeah. Yeah. David Hope is just, he, during the quarantine, he created a scale walking Minecraft map of Brook Lottie Distillery. You can go on YouTube and take a, a Minecraft tour of the distillery that is completely accurate. That is amazing. <laughs> That's very cool. I'll have to check that out. So let's talk about Adam. I, I don't know. Well, tell me more about Adam, his, <laughs> his approach, because I know it sounded like he was like, yeah, I'm glad I got the recipes, but yeah, I'm going to do my own thing. He's a young guy. He's taking up quite the mantle. Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. But that story where he took the recipe that was given to him by Jim and threw it away. Yeah. I think that that story there is such a perfect example of the kind of guy that Adam is and also 
the kind of teacher that Jim is. Yeah. I remember hearing that story and just thinking that that was just such a beautiful example of teacher and student where the teacher is leaving, trying to give his student a leg up and saying, this is my last act is to give you this recipe so that your first release of this whiskey, the black art should be this one here. Right. And that the student, Adam, throws it away because the real lesson that he learned from Jim is to be his own person and to do his own thing. I just think it's a beautiful story of these two people, student and teacher, sort of learning from each other something they weren't intending to necessarily. And so, yeah, I think it's beautiful. And for those of you who don't know the story, he throws away this recipe, throws away the recipe for the black art that Jim gives him and goes and makes his own. And I mean, he's done tremendously well there, Adam has. We've been back several times. We went last year to the Feish and he did an Octomore tasting that, I mean, I thought was one of the most incredible whiskey experiences of my life. Just tasting these, uh, maybe it wouldn't be for you, Carrie, because we're talking about right. peat levels peated, that yeah. are uh, north of 150 right? Um, and sometimes north of 300. But we were drinking these whiskeys that had peat levels north of 300 and had an ABV of like 70%. And he had said something in during the tasting, he had said that what makes Brook Lottie special is that they create these whiskeys that if you read about them on paper should be disgusting <laughs> and undrinkable. Right. But then you taste them and they're sublime. And that's part of the magic is they're able to balance these incredibly, I can't think of a better word, but so I'd say uh, violent components. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's harmonious when it hits your tongue. Mm -hmm. It's really... Well, what I find so interesting about the distillery is that they have like the peatiest scotches, but then they also have this great range of unpeated whiskey, which most of the Isle of distilleries don't offer. So I kind of think that's really interesting that they do the whole entire range from peated to non-peated and from like the very peatiest peated. I mean, that's one thing that I really admire about them. And also when I was there, they had, and I don't know if they still have this, but they would have in the tour guide area at the end, you could bottle your own whiskey straight from a barrel. So I did. And it's actually signed here by Jim. So that was kind of fun. Oh, wow. And I got to put the stickers on it and I got to seal it and all that stuff. So, and I actually broke into it last year. I was going to save it forever. And then I decided, why am I saving this? I should enjoy it's it. It's made to be drunk. And now I wish I didn't drink it all because now I would give some to Louise to come up with a recipe for it. <laughs> well, they do still do that. They have two at all times there, at least now. One Port Charlotte, one Brook Lottie, so peated and unpeated. Right. And, you know, I told Jim the day I met him that I had a bottle of the Resurrection Dram. And he said to me, I haven't taken that to heart just with that whiskey, but with all my whiskey. He said, keep that for a special day, but don't keep it forever. Yep. <laughs> it's meant to be drunk. Well, I did keep it for a special day and I did drink it. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's one other thing about those bottles that they do with the self-bottling ones is that they also, they choose a face of a person working in the distillery to put on the label, which is really cool. Yes. Because there's no hierarchical structure to it. It's it's not always the executive staff that have their face on the bottle. It's everyone. Everyone right. is open to having it and it feels like a really special thing. Mine is, it says number 11, and then it says Raymond Tibbs, retail assistant and tour guide. So, Oh, Raymond's tip. He still works there. Oh, cool. That's wonderful. I, well, I have his picture right here on my bottle. So, <laughs> Game of free whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> That's my kind of girl. <laughs> it's uh, complimentary, my dear Brittany. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and Greg, what was your favorite part? <laughs> Wait, no, I need to have a more sophisticated answer. That's horrifying. <laughs> we'll we'll, go, we'll yeah. come back to you. Okay. Free whiskey. We'll come back to we'll you. We'll come back. Okay. You think of something. <laughs> you just think of something more adult and we'll get back to you. All right. <laughs> Bye. Um, so, Greg, what was your favorite part about making this movie? You know, I mean, it was my favorite shoot I've ever done in my life, without a doubt. I mm -hmm. mean, and everything about it was amazing and fun. You know, we it was very collegial. There was a pretty small crew, as documentaries tend to have. And most of the time, we all lived in one house together. And for the most part, we all got along really well and drank copious amounts of whiskey every night <laughs> nice. and worked every day. And it, it didn't have like a, a rigid, like a 7 a.m. call time. We, we'd have call times, but we didn't have like a clear wrap because we would just shoot until we had finished that day's stuff and then just have a great time. And I really felt like, you know, I know Christine Vachon talks about Sometimes the best shoots make the worst films and the worst shoots make the best films that they're not related, you know. But in my case, in this instance, in my opinion, we made a really, really great film and had a great time doing it. And so that's the big picture thing. I loved all of it. I'm sorry if that sounds like a cop out, but it's not at all. No, it, it doesn't. Because, you know, I've been in, in filmmaking now for 22-ish years, including my college filmmaking. I mean, I've had one favorite movie that was probably the hardest I've ever worked, but it was my favorite 
movie to work on. But my favorite show to ever work on was the pilot that we did about whiskey. And I've done other sizzle shoots related to whiskey. And all of those sizzle shoots and the pilot still make me more happy than any other job that I've done in television. So I get it. Mm -hmm. You know, the one thing I will say is I also got invited to go a week ahead of the rest of the crew and work in a distillery for a week. Oh, lucky. And I, every day I did a different job. You native. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Was it at Brooklady or was it somewhere else? No, it was at the Glasgow distillery in Glasgow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. And the first day I learned, I mashed in. And the second day I, second day I helped with the wash backs. And then, the, then I helped with the wash still, then the spirit still. Then I spent a day as a cooper. You know, I'm not an expert at any of them, but it was a really great way of sort of getting to know some of the things that I wouldn't have known otherwise that I had no clue of a week before. Sure. There's nothing like time on the shop floor to get you in touch with the mechanics of producing anything. Trevor, what was your favorite part about doing this show? I mean, there's so many, so many amazing stories. I mean, to Brittany's point, the not just the free whiskey, but the incredible whiskey and, <laughs> that we had. I don't know if we're allowed to say any of this, but you know, we tried 75-year-old Gordon McPhail Mortlock, 75-year-old Mortlock, which wow. had been distilled before World War II. How was it? Was it woody? It was woody. It was yeah. woody. Definitely, <laughs> I, would, I would think so. Definitely a heavy oak on that. But um, my favorite part about it was like you... Carrie, I have almost all of my experiences in narrative filmmaking and television. So to go and be in person with, like to sit in a room with Charlie and have a dram and talk about whiskey for a couple of hours, and just to hear his stories was amazingly authentic and real. And same thing with Jim and with Mark. I mean, honestly, those three and the same with Rachel Berry's, just you could sit in the room and hear the stories that they have to tell for days. Uh, there was something so genuine and authentic about the people we were talking to. And I had not made a documentary feature before this. And so that experience of authentic storytelling from real people talking about their lives and their passion to me was intoxicating. And, and not just because I was intoxicated. But, um, <laughs> Which brings us back to Brittany. <laughs> what was your real favorite part about doing this movie? Yeah, I, honestly, it kind of mirrors what the guys are saying is the experiences, like the really singular, unique experiences that you otherwise wouldn't get. Like, I remember there was one day where we were, um, you know, I think we were shooting like really late in London. And then we took a plane the next morning with almost no sleep. So there's like the delirium added to it, which makes it all a little twinkly and interesting. I don't even know what that means. But that's how it felt. And yeah, it's very, very different than the type of, you know, being on a television show or something. And so we'd be flying from London to, um, I think we went to Glasgow first. Yeah. Right? Okay, cool. And we did some interviews. And then I remember like nine in the morning, we were with Chris Leggett. And we're, you know, in their private tasting room and we're interviewing him and he's saying all these amazing, interesting, fascinating things. And then has us, tr well, also it's trying whiskey at nine in the morning is not a, a regular occurrence. Um, <laughs> it's business. <laughs> Although it's becoming so for me and Philip. <laughs> indeed, but, indeed. <laughs> and um, being able to drink it with them and drink these incredible, like rare, old, delicious, what have you, whiskeys. And it was just... It was so cool. I mean, you know, we had our schedule every day, like any kind of film shoot, but with a documentary, I and mean, certainly with our documentary, the schedule does not even begin to describe the things that you're going to do that day. And, uh, and you, can't, you can't really know. It's the adventure to come. You know what would have been really funny is if we'd come back to you and you'd said, yeah, it's still the free whiskey. joke. <laughs> 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 Which, you know, being that you had an all-nighter and you haven't gone to sleep yet, that would be okay to say that. It would be okay. Yeah. Big question, key question, critical question. How did you get the film financed? Because financing a film of any sort is notoriously difficult. How'd you guys get it done? It was certainly not any less difficult, I think, for us. The one thing that we did, we raised private equity in small parcels from a bunch of extremely generous people, but also we did a crowdfund as well. Mm -hmm. So we raised half of the budget through crowdfund, which was amazing for a number of reasons. It allowed us to engage in our audience before we were even able to start making the film, mm -hmm. but also it lessened the burden of our private equity raise. Mm -hmm. It feels like we filmed almost nonstop for 10 years. Uh, <laughs> cinematographer went over for a week or two, right, Craig, at the beginning? Like eight days, yeah. 
uh, that was before we did our main crowdfund. Then we used some of that footage to help propel our crowdfund. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we went back for the main portion of our shoot, which was, I believe, four weeks in November, as Greg was saying. It was very cold. And then we went back again for another week. Or uh, How long was the third trip back when we went to Ireland? Well, that was like where we flew every day. Yeah, we went to Ireland. We went to England. We went to Scotland. And then it was like, yeah, maybe a week. And then we flew back to L.A. And then within six days, two of us flew to Australia. Oh, geez. That so, was only a week? Are you kidding me? Uh, yeah, remember we were on planes every single day. We flew from L.A. to Ireland, then Ireland to London, then London to Glasgow. Then I think we drove we to drove Edinburgh. Edinburgh. <laughs> yeah. And if I you think- want to talk about travel planning, that was a, a beast. <laughs> so we wrap all of our interviews with cocktail talk. So let's talk about cocktails. What are your go-tos? Do you have a go-to category, uh, a go-to few? I do, yeah. I I don't drink cocktails very often, but I really, I, I would say my go-to is probably French 75s because I also really love wine and I love champagne. And um, so, yeah, I had a lot of French 75s. Uh-huh. And I also really love the Tiki 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 Rum, which is the <laughs> name from Trader Sam's Disney. Yep. I've had that. Yes. <laughs> so I love that. And because I do like rum and like coconutty, pineapple mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the, the mug that I bought from Trader Sam's, that it comes in like this really like cool, fun, like um, tiki looking mug. I bought it. And now um, during lockdown, sometimes I go into my backyard with my mug and I put rum and whatever type of juice I have at, at the moment and pretend that I'm back in Trader Sam's, mm. which I know most people would be like, I want to be on a beach in Hawaii. And I'm like, I want to be at a restaurant in Disney world. <laughs> I know. That's, but you know what? I, I mean, we used to go, I, I, w- I was a pass holder for years and years and we used to go at least once a month. And one of our stops was always going to, to Trader Sam's and getting, you know, some cocktails. Yeah. Um, I'm a pass and, holder right now. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then we would go to the, one of the restaurants and eat. We'd, you know, it was like, everyone's like, but you're, you're not spending the whole day. I'm like, we don't need to spend the whole day in the park because we have passes. Like, that's what so. I do. I go for a couple hours, hang out, drink a tiki, 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 tiki run. Tiki. I don't know. The don't plan was drink. always in the morning, collect all the fast passes you could because back then you had to get you, them. There was a the system place. and you can get them like a certain way. But now they've improved their thing. So it's not as easy to get them all in the morning. But so we would get them all in the morning and then go lunch and then, you know, go back and be a little drunk on the rides. It's great. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, boys, what about you? Greg? Trevor? <laughs> I'll jump in. I am not a big cocktail guy, but if I'm not going to have a straight whiskey, I am a big martini guy. Mm. Oh, yeah. Love Maybe. a martini. Mm-hmm. What kind of martini? Gin mm-hmm. only. Mm-hmm. Okay. And Scotland has become gin central. You know, that's right. And I was drinking Especially botanist. At yeah, I was drinking botanist way before I knew that it was a Brooklady gin. Mm-hmm. When I went there, I was really shocked by it. In fact, they had a, another cool thing there at the di- at the distillery in the uh, gift shop. They have a bar where they do like uh, botanist cocktail classes and you know that kind of thing, where you can go and collect, go out with them, collect botanicals, and then come back. And they, I don't think you get to make the gin there, but you can sort of smell the components of the botanist before they're. Uh, which is really cool, uh, but I'm I'm a big gin fan. Gin and 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 uh, whiskey are the, the two favorites for me. But I also would drink a Manhattan, but more for the holidays. I think holidays are like you know Christmas when it starts to get cold and a a nice Manhattan or mm-hmm, mm-hmm. very cool. I actually still have my bottle of gin from Brooklady that I have not drank yet. So maybe I will. Maybe we'll use that for World of Wheezy. Didn't Natalie go to the? Didn't she go to a? Um, was it Natalie and? Megan both do a botanist gin like tour at Pajil last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where I knew about it. Our wives, Greg's wife and my wife, both did the botanist botanicals tour, as it were, uh, nice. while we were there. That's very cool. Well, I don't know what Greg and I were doing. Were we doing a film related thing, or we were just? You were probably. I think it was the day of the screening, so I think we were prepping. I think uh, we were like, "That's what we were doing." Oh, that's right. I was like, "Why wasn't I there?" That sounds wonderful. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> girls trip. Totally. All right, so Greg, what's your go-to? Well, you know, honestly, I couldn't tell you the last time I drank a cocktail. Wow. It would have been at a Balvenie event, and it was a Dufton Sour, nice a whiskey sour made with with Balvenie. However, I used to drink gin and tonics all mm-hmm. the time, 
Um, and I used to drink before that. I was I drank Mai Tais for a little while. Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. Okay. Greg, didn't you, while we were traveling, I thought it was you and I could be wrong, but wasn't it you that someone introduced you to the Smoky Cokey? This, yes, that the Fashio last year. What's a Smoky Cokey? That's a Lagavulin and Coke. And that was at Lagavulin wow. that I had one. But my smoky my response to Blair mentioned it in our interview, but then I get Rory bought me one when we were at Lagavulin. And my response to it, and his was the same, which was, this tastes good. I would rather drink Lagavulin. <laughs> You know, I did, I liked the taste of it, but to me, all it did was it robbed the whiskey of all of its nuance mm-hmm. and just, you know, it was good. It was sweet and it was good and I didn't dislike it. But if I, well, not if, when I went back to the bar there, I immediately just went back to the <laughs> single malt. But I'm not, you know, I'm not a single malt snob. I'm, you know, I think people should drink what they want to drink. I just, I drink a lot of beer. I mean, beer and whiskey are my two go-tos and I'm very, very interested in beer. Trevor and I used to make beer, but we never really had the rigor to, to see it through. <laughs> nice. Which is why we're not going to get into making whiskey. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Way too much commitment. Yeah, making whiskey is not easy. But anyway, so let's talk about the movie a little bit. When does it come out and where can people see it? We started setting up what was going to be a single event. We were going to do a, a thing on Friday, January 22nd, uh, as part of the Burns Night weekend. We're doing that online. We're going to do it. We're saying it's one screening, but because we have sort of an audience all over the world, we're just going to have it screening available for video on demand for 24 hours. But as we've reached out to more and more whiskey clubs and whiskey festivals and whiskey fans online and brick and mortar, it's become apparent that there's more opportunity than we could possibly squeeze into a 24 hour period. So that has now grown to being we're going to make the film available for five days that could extend out more than that. But what we're doing is once a day for those five days, we're going to do a special event in addition to the film. We showed the entire cast of the film, a copy of the film, and they really, we got a great response from them. And they have all generously made themselves available to do live Q&As, tastings, um, conversation with me, conversations with each other. So we're, we're kind of planning a lot of different events, but starting on Friday, January 22nd. If there's a chance to get an invite to that, I would not say no. Yeah, we might say yes. Yeah, <laughs> of course. And great work. Great work, by the way. Just a really well done film. Yes. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. My, and my favorite topic for a documentary, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> you know, speaking of premiere, what we've been wanting to do for a long time is to do a premiere of the film that is also a tasting. Lovely. That you taste in conjunction with the film as we touch on certain whiskeys, you would then try that whiskey and you could have a real four-dimensional experience. That's awesome. And that actually reminds me of something that we did in the Scotch Club in, what year was it? It was the Back to the Future anniversary. It was in October something of what year? I forget. Oh, in 2015? Yes. So a friend of ours owns the house in Pasadena where What's what? his name? Fell out of the Stop tree. Down John, out of the tree. Uh, John McDonald. Uh, yeah, John McDonald. Mm-hmm. Oh, cool! I've never yeah. seen someone. I didn't know that was. Yeah, he's also a bagpiper, by the mm-hmm. way, bagpiper and a filmmaker, a documentary filmmaker as well. Yes, it's true. And now I can't remember which was it the second movie or the third movie that they went future, past, and present. I think it was the second, 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 second movie. Future. So we watched the second movie and we we drank a, a fifty-five, an eighty-five, and a fifteen. Each time they came up, we had a different. <laughs> Year dram. So it's pretty cool. This is like the coolest party ever. Right? I so that. I think that's a perfect idea for your tasting to do yeah. something like that. Like, here's a Brooklady, here's a, a, a Belvini, here's the, you know, all the each, here's a Glasgow. Right. Right. Fun, 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 fun. Yeah. Movies and drinking. Right, what better is there to do? I mean, absolutely <laughs> nothing better to do. So again, thank you guys so much for being on the show and we look forward to your premiere. And, um, yeah, thanks for everything. It was fun. All right. Great. Very good. Cheers. I All don't right. ever get to talk to Brittany and Trevor this long. For- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not you don't get to. We won't allow you to. Exactly. Yeah, you, Trevor. <laughs> thanks for making them tolerate me. <laughs> yeah. I love it. All right, guys. All right. Bye. Thank All right, you so much. All. Bye, Bye-bye. 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 Yeah. Bye. Thanks. World of Wheezy is up next. Stay with us. The Center for Culinary Culture, home to the Cocktail Collection and L.A. Food and Drink Museum, has a YouTube channel featuring a mix of how-to, lively talk, and culinary entertainment. Already streaming are Cocktails, The Grand Tour, Culinary Quickies, Music and Booze with Mo, and this podcast, Spirits of Whiskey. 
New shows coming soon include Complete Greek, telling the story of Greek food one dish at a time, and Spirits of Rum, a podcast featuring personalities from the wide world of cane spirits. Find us on YouTube, the Center for Culinary Culture, and subscribe now. The Center for Culinary Culture, telling the story of food and drink one taste at a time. Hey, Louise, good to have you on the show today. How's it hanging? It's good, it's good. So um, today we switched it up on you a little bit. Normally we do whiskey because, you know, it is called Spirits of Whiskey. But since we interviewed the guys who uh, and ladies who made the, the new movie coming out, The Water of Life, and that movie is a documentary, but primarily a good chunk of it takes takes place at Brook Lottie. And when I was at Brook Lottie myself in 2015, not only did I get to bottle my own bottle of whiskey, but I tried their gin and I, I, I find their gin fantastic. And so since we did talk to them about the gin, we thought let's give you a fun thing to work on. And so I got you some botanist gin from Brook Lottie. What'd you think? Loved it. I also am a huge gin lover. It's one of my favorite liquors. I mean, I pretty much like all liquors, but <laughs> if I am going to a bar and I'm gonna have a drink before a meal, I would either usually order a Manhattan if I'm in the mood for brown liquor, or if I'm in the mood for a clear liquor, I go for gin most of the time, gin martini. So that is to say, I, this, I loved this. I loved it. It, ha, it was such a new, unique spirit to me. The botanicals represented in it just like had my mind going in a million different directions trying to figure out like, okay, well, do I want to, whatever I make, do I want to pair it with just this, like a straight version of the gin or, you know, I was reading through their cocktails and I liked that they had a 50-50 martini, which sounded great. And then I got to the Bee's Knees cocktail, which I, that's just such a really good classic drink. Yeah. And I was thinking like, okay, I can see that with scallops. Scallops have a natural sweetness. Well, especially too, because it's a seaside. That's where they make it right there on the ocean at, in Isla. So. Exactly, exactly. And again, I've never been there, but I can pretty much Im imagine the scallops that they're eating there are outrageous. Oh, they're good. Yeah. They're really good. <laughs> yeah. Like I don't even have to, I mean, no, you do not have to like try to convince me of that. I, I feel like I can taste them, you know? <laughs> so I was thinking, okay, well, one of my favorite preparations of scallops is something that I've had in some Japanese restaurants restaurants, which is nothing more than a lightly seared, it's basically like a scallop sashimi, but what they do is they'll take a blowtorch and just torch one side of it. Okay. So so if the if the scallops are large, they kind of slice them horizontally to kind of make thin slices and then right. just take a little torch and torch it. And one of the common condiments that is used to dress them is something called yuzu koshu, which is one of my all-time favorite condiments on planet Earth. It's a fermented seasoning with yuzu peel, which if you're not familiar with yuzu, it's kind of like a looks like a wrinkly skinned lemon but it oh. extremely distinct in in its flavor profile I mean it doesn't taste like a lemon it doesn't taste like a lime it's you know that it's a citrus fruit but you don't if you've never had it you're like wow this is like a whole new world right and anyway this yuzu kosho is and I'm sure I'm butchering the pronunciation is this seasoning in which you take the yuzu peel and some chilies and salt and you ferment it and you end up with this salty citrusy spicy little number and it and when you put it with scallops it is so damn good wow so good and then i'm like all right a little bit of that heat from the yuzu kosho with the scallops and the sweetness of the bee's knees with the honey and everything i think would just be completely awesome no that sounds good yeah what i think is really interesting about your choice with this is that you know brook is right there on the ocean side in isla and for their whiskeys they they char the barrels similar to how you're saying they you know to char the to the scallop so I think that's kind of um cool yeah 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 I mean like that's kind of when I'm thinking of pairings I like to do my research and kind of figure out like you know I have noticed because I haven't given you any tips I just drop off the stuff and leave <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, it's the COVID drop off. And and of course, you know, when it's when you're tasting something and you're not in the setting, it sometimes can be a little bit like, all right, well, I know what this would taste good with right here sitting in my kitchen in California, but like I really try to imagine what I would be eating and experiencing if I were in a place. I mean, and right, right now since we can't travel, that's as good as it's going to get. So, right. well, hopefully soon we will be traveling and hopefully even sooner the show will get picked up and we'll be going everywhere and you can make whatever you want anywhere you want yes fun. everybody wear your damn mask right please wear mask your mask. Or casket <laughs> i love it i love it i have not heard that one it's a little bit i mean i'm not trying to be flippant for for those who have lost loved ones due to covid at all i mean because it's completely horrendous no right but you know for those people that are blatantly saying i don't believe in masks because whatever yeah that's how mad i get over it I just get so upset. So anyway, there you have it. So great. Well, then I will uh, catch up with you next time and we will see what's going on on the next show. That sounds great. For show notes on today's podcast, please visit our website at spiritsofwhiskey.com. That's whiskey with an E. We'll include links and supporting documents from today's Whiskey Chronicles, as well as tasting notes and recommendations from today's World of Wheezy. As always, you'll see upcoming topics, a guest roster, and links to past shows. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, salam. Salam You can become a sustaining supporter of Spirits of Whiskey by making a monthly donation. Just visit the Spirits of Whiskey page at anchor.fm. That's anchor.fm forward slash spirits dash of dash whiskey and click on the support button. And if you really like us, give us a five star rating and a review. Thank you. Spirits of Whiskey is produced by First Real Entertainment and the Center for Culinary Culture, home of the Cocktail Collection, and is available via Anchor, Apple, Google, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and wherever fine podcasts are heard.